Alrighty. Hi, everyone. Sorry that this is not in person this week. Um, but I still wanted to give you a little review session since I do know you have a quiz on Sunday. Um, so hopefully this is still helpful. I know the homework was due last night as well, but thank you for being accommodating. And I hope that this is um, still helpful for you for anything you have coming up. Um, so I'm going to run this very similar to how I run my usual sessions. So this is kind of like what you want to see. I will give you some tips and some information about that, some practice problems. Um, see that we have one request for non-ideal gases and then the N and M and L stuff, so like your quantum numbers. Um, I believe your non-ideal gases were on last week's quiz. So like say we start with the quantum numbers portion since we just talked about that in class yesterday. And then, um, and then we'll go to the um, non-ideal gas stuff afterwards. Um, if you have anything else that you would like to see during this hour, please let me know and I'd be happy to accommodate that. Um, and yeah, we can, I guess, get started if, unless there's any questions for me before we begin. Okay, are we all okay to start at quantum numbers that we talked about yesterday in class? I'll take silence as yes. All righty. So we will start with our quantum numbers. So when we talk about quantum numbers, we are defining an electron. So this helps us define like the location um, of electron. Okay, so there are technically four numbers that go into a single quantum number. So the first one that we talk about is n. Can anyone tell me what n means in a quantum number or what that represents? Okay, so N is going to be defining our uh, energy level or our shell. So this will tell us the energy and shell of your uh, electron. So when we talk about energy, it's going to be like um, if it's close to the nucleus or if it's far away from the nucleus. So when we talk about N, N is equal to one, for example, This means it's going to be really close to the nucleus. Right, when we talk about n is equal to five, this is a higher energy level, so this is going to be farther away from the nucleus. Okay, any questions on that so far? The possible numbers for n that we can have are any positive integer. So we could have n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. We usually tend only to talk about energy levels up until n is equal to 5, but 6 and 7 do exist as well. Okay, I can ask again, just in case anyone wants to reply to me this time. Does anyone know what the L quantum number represents? Good. So L is going to represent the shape of our the shape of our orbital or the angular momentum. That's also true, Ethan. Um, if you look this up online, like usually L is considered the angular momentum. Um, and other another way to say that is the shape of the subshell. So we can call this the shape of 
subshell. Okay, and this is what's going to tell us whether it's that, fear, that sphere shape, that dumbbell shape, or that clover shape that Dr. Altamont was talking about. Um, is this is going to relate to all of that. So does anyone remember the rule for what values of L it can be? What possible values of L there are? Yeah, awesome, right? So we can have L can be equal to N minus one all the way down to zero. Right, so if N is equal to four, that means L can equal three, two, one, or zero. So there's four possibilities for L when N is equal to four. Okay, each of those numbers is related to a specific shape or a specific letter for that uh, subshell. So when L equals zero, does anyone remember what letter this corresponds to? Does anyone remember what zero? Maybe I'll give you zero. So zero was S. So when L is equal to one, what does that equal? Does anyone remember what letter that one is? Yep, awesome, awesome. Okay, when L is equal to two, what's the next letter? Awesome. And then when L is equal to three, this will be your F subshell. Okay. The same way that like um, N is equal to one is a lower energy level than N is equal to five. When L is equal to zero, that S is going to be a lower energy level um, than F most of the time. Um, but in any case, when L is equal to zero, you will always be in the S subshell. When your L is equal to one, you're always going to be in the P subshell. When L is equal to two, you can always be in the D subshell. Okay. Any questions on the first two quantum numbers so far? Okay, we're just talking about the energy and the shell that we're in so far, or the energy and the subshell, I guess, of, that we're in so far. All right, so our next quantum number is going to be M sub L. Does anyone know what M sub L refers to? Yeah, right. So your um, M sub L is going to refer to your orbital. And this is also the orientation of your uh, electron. Awesome, great job. Okay, so when we look at your um, orbital or M sub L, there are a couple of options. Does anyone remember the rule for the options of values that we can have? So like if N is equal, I'm sorry, not if N, what's the M sub L could equal what? Awesome, we can have negative L to positive L. Okay, so if L is equal to one, that means that F sub L can equal negative one, zero, or one. Okay, so when we look at the L is equal to one subshell or that P subshell, there are three different orientations we can have. And that's that dumbbell that we were talking about, right? It can have the X orientation, it can have the Y orientation, or it can have the Z orientation. Okay, your negative one doesn't always have to be the X, and then your zero doesn't always have to be the Y, and your one doesn't always have to be the Z. 
as long as you know that negative one, zero, and one refer to those three different orientations that we can have, or you know that if there's three options, there's three orientations, that's perfectly good. Okay, you just want to remember that rule and then what it means. Okay, so just as another example, right, if L was equal, if L was equal to three, then we could have M sub L equal to negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. And so there's seven different orbitals when L is equal to three. Okay, what questions do we have on M sub L? You don't need to know necessarily what axis these refer to, um, especially with like L is equal to two and L is equal to three. There's like Z squareds in there stuff. Um, you don't need to memorize that at all. You just need to know that there's, you know, five options for your orientation of your orbital. Ready? Any questions at all? We're all still here so far. <laughs> all righty. So those are like the big three that we usually talk about for quantum numbers. Um, those are the most important, but then the last orbital or the last quantum number that we talk about is the M sub S. And this is going to be the spin of your electron. Okay, can anyone tell me how many electrons can go in an orbital? Good. So you can only have two electrons per orbital. So we need two different values that we can use to differentiate between the one, one electron versus the other. So Dr. Altimos mentioned that electrons have spin, you can either have an upspin or a downspin. And so the two possible values that for M sub S you can have are positive one half and negative one half. Okay, so each quantum number or each set of four, you can have a one, you can have a zero, you can have a zero, and then you can have a plus one half or a minus one half, right? Those would be like the differentiation between that same, that electron in the, or those two electrons in the same orbital, you can differentiate between the two of them because one will have an upspin and one will have a downspin. Okay. Again, you don't need to know which one is up and which one is down in terms of your electron. You just need to make sure that they are um, different if you're writing the same quantum number for them. Okay, what questions do we have about the four quantum numbers? Do we want to do a little practice, couple of practice questions with the quantum numbers? Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, let's do. Okay, let's start with this question. So I wanna know what are the possible quantum numbers when N is equal to three and L is equal to one. So take some time, think about what, um, what your M sub L and your M sub S could be for these. Okay, I'll give you about a minute to kind of think on your own and then we can kind of talk about it and then I'll give you another question.
Okay, does anyone have an idea of what a possible quantum number could be? So we're looking for m sub l and n sub s. So we know that we're going to start off with three and then one. So like what's going to be the next number that follows with a possible number? Yeah, awesome, right? So we can have negative one, we can have three, one, zero, or we can have three, one, one. Awesome. Okay, so if we have negative one, zero, or one, what's the next number that can go to finish off our quantum number? Good, so we can have plus one half or minus one half. So if all of these get plus one half, then we can also write three, one, minus one, minus one half, three, one, zero, plus one half, or I'm sorry, minus one half. And then three, one, one, minus one half. Okay, so there's six total electrons possible for when L is equal to one. Okay, and re remind me what does, or what letters associated with L is equal to one? What subshell does that refer to? Good, this is the P orbital, or the P subshell. Okay. So when you have P subshells, does anyone know how many orbitals are in a P subshell? Good, yep, perfect. Okay, so we have three orbitals in our P subshell. Each of those orbitals can hold two electrons. So we see that we have three times two is equal to six six total electrons and how many how many quantum numbers were we able to were we able to write down good and we were able to write down six right so we have Six total electrons, six different quantum numbers that we can write down. Each of them are going to be different and distinct. And so that's where that comes from. Okay, does that make sense how we can get this type of question? Yep, so it's two electrons for every orbital. So if we were in L is equal to um l is equal to not s and l is equal to zero which means we're in the s subshell how many orbitals are in an s subshell how many orbitals so how many possible how many possible values of m sub l are there for s right if l is equal to 0 what is m sub l equal yes yeah, so i think ethan is replying to say that there's only one orbital, right? So when L is equal to zero, M sub L is equal to zero, which means that there's only one orbital available. Okay, so since there's only one orbital available, the S subshell can hold two electrons. OK, 
Okay, does that make sense? So any orbital you have can only have two electrons in it. And two is the maximum. It can hold one and it can hold zero, but then it can max have two. Any questions so far on quantum numbers? Making a little bit more sense? Okay, let's try another practice problem. Okay, so how many orbitals are there when n is equal to four? I guess, let me, let me, how many total orbitals are there when n is equal to four. I have one for seven. I'll give you like another minute and then we can kind of talk about what that means. Yep, absolutely, Ethan. All righty, let's talk about this one here. So I'm looking for how many total orbitals are there when n is equal to four. So when n is equal to four, we need in order to get to orbitals, we need to get to n sub l, right? So if n is equal to four, what does that mean l is equal to? What are the possible numbers for l in this case? Good. So we can have zero, one, two, or three. So if L is equal to zero, one, two, or three, what possible options do we have for M sub L? Good. So we can have negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, or three. Okay. So just based off of this, right, we can see that at n is equal to four, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different orbitals that are available. Okay. But that's just for like possible values that um, m sub l could be. If we started to write down all of the quantum numbers that an energy level of four could have, we would see that we have a lot more than seven available to us, right? We can start off by saying four, four, zero, zero, plus one half, okay? And then we could say four, zero, zero, minus one half. So that means that L is equal to zero here is done. So this is already two um, electrons. And so that's one orbital that we talked about. How many orbitals does um, L you have when L is equal to one, right? So this is when L is equal to zero. When L is equal to, when L is equal to one, how many orbitals do we have? When L is equal to one, how many orbitals are there? Okay. 
Nope, not zero, right? What are our possible? Yep, perfect, right? So you can have three orbitals. and then six total electrons, right? So we said that for L is equal to zero, we have one orbital. When L is equal to one, we have three. When L is equal to two, how many orbitals do we have? Good, there's five. How many? Um, electrons are there when there's five orbitals. Good, there's 10 electrons. And then when L is equal to three, how many orbitals are there? Good, there's seven orbitals. With two each, that's 14 electrons. Okay, so when N is equal to four, we don't just have those seven options. We have this orbital, these three orbitals, these five orbitals, and these seven orbitals. So we actually have a total of one plus three plus five plus seven. And if I can do mental math, that equals 16 total orbitals. Okay, so it's not just that negative three to positive three orbitals that we have. That is a possibility because we do see that when n when l is equal to three, but l could also be equal to two, and l could also be equal to one, and also equal to zero. So we have all those different options available to us for the number of orbitals in our system. Does that make sense how we found the total number of orbitals? Right, if we were just talking about when n is equal to four and l is equal to three, then we would just have the negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, and that would give us our seven total orbitals. But here, since we're just talking about energy level four, we have to talk about all possibilities of l, and then therefore all possibilities of m sub l. Okay, so we have 16 total electrons orbitals here, which means we would have 32 total electrons. We wanted to talk about it that way as well. Okay, any questions on quantum numbers? Is there anything we're still a little confused about? Any more information or practice problems we want to see with them? I think we'll talk about a little talk about them a little bit more on Friday tomorrow. Um, and so I'm trying to try and put together a couple more practice problems, a couple more notes for that. Anything else so far? Okay, we'll move on to the next request um, that I saw. And so that was for non-ideal gases. Um, is there anything specific about non-ideal gases or is there just um, like kind of brief overview of what those mean, what a non-ideal gas is? No, okay, perfect. So when we talk about non-ideal gases, um, There is not as much math involved with non-ideal gases as with ideal gases. Um, I know that there's that crazy equation she gave you in your notes. Um, you will not need to use that equation. Um, she mostly wants you to know the concepts behind a non-ideal gas and like what makes something a non-ideal gas, what conditions are involved with that. Okay, so when we have a non-ideal gas, that means that our gas is at a high pressure and we're at a low temperature. 
Okay. So I kind of like to think about this as I'm boiling water, right? If you want to boil water, you're going to increase the temperature on your stove and you're going to um, allow that gas to expand, right? As gas gets hot, it expands its shape and that's why it gets into the bubble um, and then it can escape into the air, right? Same thing if we took water, right? That's a liquid. If we wanted to make that solid, we have to put it in the freezer, which is a colder temperature. So that makes it an ice cube instead. So if something is at a cold temperature, it's going to act more as a solid. And then if it's at a high pressure, it's going to act more as a solid or a liquid would. So you can kind of think about um, if you took a basketball and then squeezed it down to the size of a golf ball, all that gas that you had inside of your basketball would still be in that golf ball, but they're going to be really close together and they're going to be um, interacting a lot more. So that causes them to act more as a solid, which is why, or I'm, I'm not sure if that's why, but right, you can think of a golf ball as pretty solid on the inside because there's not a lot of room for um, gaseous particles or whatever. Um, so non-ideal gases behave non-ideally at high pressures and low temperatures. Ideal gases, we see at low pressures, and high temperatures. Okay, low pressure is associated with a large volume, right? If your pressure is low, that means your volume has to be high. But here, if your um, pressure is high, that means you have to have a lower volume, okay? So when you have low pressures, it's associated with higher volume, and that allows your gas to expand and act gaseously. Um, high temperatures, again, you usually boil things or make things hot in order to escape them to the gaseous phase. Um, and so that's when they're going to behave most like an ideal gas. Okay. I think the big thing behind ideal non-ideal gases is um, the conditions in which they behave like a non-ideal gas. And that's going to be at high pressures and low temperatures. Okay, any questions on non-ideal gases? Does that help a little bit in terms of non-ideal gases? I know one thing she might ask you like visually what something would look like for in terms of a non-ideal gas. Um, I believe she had like this chart here. Um, so a non-ideal gas, or I'm sorry, an ideal gas would increase linearly. I believe this was pressure and this was volume. Um, if I remember correctly, right, that was going to increase linearly. But your non ideal this is a, an ideal gas. But your non ideal gas would kind of go like this and then increase something like that, right? So it's not going to look like a straight line. And this would be a non ideal gas. I might be wrong in terms of my axes, but um, the big thing here is that it doesn't look like a straight line um, and behaves a little bit differently. And that's going to be at our, oh, sorry, this is probably temperature. It's probably temperature. So that's going to be at your um, like low temperatures or low temperatures and high pressures. Okay. Any, James, does that help with your non-ideal gases or is there anything else you wanted to see from there? You won't need to use that big equation that she showed. Um, you just know that that exists. And if you do need to use it for whatever reason, she'll give it to you and um, on your formula sheet so that you can reference it as well. Okay, awesome. Okay, and then I think Ethan, you talked about um, energy equation problems. Is this like the Bohr model equation that we talked about Monday is my guess? Or is there like, um, just like the HC lambda or anything like that? Anything specific from there in terms of energy?
Okay, perfect. So we can do that. So I believe we talked briefly about it on uh, Friday last week, just in terms of like touching on light. Um, so there's going to be, I would say like four big equations that we use when we talk about um, light and emission spectra and all that fun stuff there. So um, your big equation that you're going to use is going to be your speed of light is equal to lambda times frequency. I tend to give frequency like the little thing on the side. Um, so this will be the speed of light. Does anyone know what the speed of light is? On the top of their head. That's a constant. Yep, awesome. Um, I believe this will be given to you um, on your formula sheet in terms of the speed of light. So I wouldn't worry too much about memorizing it just in case you've used it a lot recently and you remember as well. Um, okay, so that's gonna be the speed of light. Your um, lambda is going to be wavelength. And then this V is going to be your frequency. Your frequency is in hertz or one over seconds, and then your wavelength is in meters. Um, most of the time you'll have a wavelength of nanometers. So if you get something that's like three, four, five um, nanometers, that's pretty good. Um, or something like 3.45 times 10 to the negative seven meters, that's you're in a good spot in terms of your calculation. And then your frequency um, is usually something times 10 to the 14th, one over seconds. Um, both of those, if you get some sort of those exponents, then that's a good indication that you're in the right spot. Okay, and then the other one that we use is going to be your energy is equal to HC. Here, this is the energy in joules. And it's the energy of the photon. that's going to be in joules. Your H is Planck's constant. Does anyone remember what Planck's constant is? It's also... If it's negative 34? And then C is going to be um, the speed of light again. For Planck's constant, that will be a constant she gives you on your formula sheet. So if I'm telling you the wrong thing, I apologize, um, but I believe that is correct. Okay, so we can combine these and we can say, if we solve for frequency, we can say that C over lambda is equal to frequency. I'm sorry, this is not HC. This is H frequency. I jumped, jumped ahead of myself. Apologize, that is in frequency. So we can say that the frequency from your speed of light equation, our equation is C over lambda, and then we can plug E is equal to H times C over lambda. So that means that E is equal to HC over lambda. So that's like a combined energy question that you can, or equation that you can use. Um, if you're just given the wavelength and asked for the energy of your photon, you can use that instead of having to solve for frequency in the mean, um, in like the middle portions there. Okay, questions on those two equations so far. Alrighty, so this H or this energy is equal to HC over lambda um, can be used when we talk about the transition from a high energy state to a low energy state or a lower energy state to a high energy state. All right, so something uh, or if a Bohr atom and a hydrogen atom is absorbing light, one of the electrons can uh, jump up to a higher energy level and we can uh, 
calculate that difference between the two. So for a combined equation there, you to find the difference between those two energy levels. We can say that the energy is equal to negative 2.817 times 10 to the negative 18th, I believe, if I am correct. I'm, this number is a little off. This is 718 times 10 to 18. Yeah, joules. Okay, that's that constant there. Again, this will be given to you so you don't have to question it. And this is 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. So this is your final energy level. And this is your initial. That is a good question, Ethan. Um, I don't remember the derivation of this. Of this equation. I think that is true, um, but I might be totally lying to you. I believe that, that it is the hc though, um, the h times c. Probably pretty easy. Probably pretty easy to find out too. I don't have, I just don't have my calculator on me right now. <laughs> but that'll always be given to you, so um, I wouldn't worry too, too much about it. Okay, I believe that's all I want to say for this one. Um, the important thing, oh, the important thing to remember about this uh, equation here is that it is always final minus initial. So if you're, um, you know, solving for an initial um, energy level, like you always want to make sure that that's the second value you work with or else it might end up negative um, or positive and you need it to be the other way around. Okay, any questions on, the, like this is actually technically delta n as well. Um, any questions on like the delta e equation? This is for a transition between energy levels. Okay, those are the big three I would say in terms of light. Um, those involve energy, Planck's constant, speed of light, frequency, all that stuff there. Um, the typical things that we talk about when we talk about um, light. Okay. The other equation that I say that we use is de Broglie's equation. This one is just a little bit different because it does involve mass. Um, and usually photons are like massless um, in terms of light, but we can talk about like electrons or protons, neutrons, something like that, um, having wave-like properties. And so that's why we talk about de Broglie's wavelength. Um, you can also, you know, find the wavelength of a human, but not really necessary. Um, but for this one, this is the wavelength is equal to H, which is still Planck's constant times the mass and the velocity. So this is wavelength still. This is your mass in kilograms. This is your velocity in meters per second. And then this is Planck's constant still. Okay, and this should end up in meters. Questions on de Broglie's wavelength? Um, 
In terms of units, I would say no, um, but it's good to know what units they should be in. Um, sometimes that's how I decide what equation I want to use for a question. Um, if I look at the units, I'm like, oh, this looks like a lot of the units that I would use for De Broglie's equation, right? Or if I'm given something in grams um, and I'm given a velocity, I'm like, oh, I might need to use De Broglie's equation because that one involves both grams and velocity. Um, right, you might need to manipulate it a little bit to make sure that it's in kilograms. But uh, in terms of units, I wouldn't say you have to like memorize them, but you should know which um, units you should plug into your equations when you have it. Does that make, does that make sense there? Okay, perfect. Alrighty, I think we have time for a question. Any questions on just general equations or lights in general? Ethan, does that help a little bit with your like energy questions and what we need to know and stuff? Not to signal you out, just know. Okay, awesome. Okay, cool. Let's try. Um, Gage, I believe, I believe all these will be provided for your exams. She's pretty good about giving you um, the equations you need. You just need to know when to use them and what they mean um, and like what each of the values mean. So I think you should get all four of these on a formula sheet. Of course. Okay, let's try let's try one of the delta E equations um, since those are a little bit trickier sometimes. So we'll say... Okay, let's try this one. So we have a photon is emitted when an electron falls from the third energy level to the second energy level. What is the energy of this photon? Okay, I'll give you like a couple minutes to kind of work on this. Um, and we'll, I'll also do the math since I just made this up. And then um, we'll reconvene in a couple minutes and we'll get, we'll get an answer.
Okay, I'll give you one more minute while I try to find the pencil I was just using. Oh, there it is. Okay, there it is. I'll still give you a minute and then we can talk about it. Alrighty, does anyone know what equation we're using? This doesn't really have a name. I would talk about it, I guess. Um, We just talked about this one. Where did my other one go? Alrighty, well, it's being stupid. Um, okay, so we're using the delta E is equal to negative 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18th times one over N final squared minus one over N initial squared. Okay, so what is going to be our N final and n initial in this case, right? What are we plugging in for n final? What energy level is that one? Good, n final is gonna be two, and that means that n initial is going to be three, right? We're falling from three to two. So we have to, our final is gonna be where it ends up. That's gonna be energy level two, and we started at n is equal to three. Okay, so this just turns into negative 2.178. Okay, and then you can just solve from there, right? We can take um, these two, I would do your parentheses first and then multiply by the negative 2.178. And what do we get for an energy? What's our change in energy? So the negative 2.178 is um, just a constant. Um, that is given to you in your equation. I believe Ethan said that's the um, H times C portion of it. Um, might be wrong, might be right. Uh, but that's just a constant that comes along with the uh, with the question or with the equation. Okay, then we have negative 3.025 times 10 to negative 19. Do we know what units energy is usually in? going to be in joules. And here, this is technically delta E. So this is the change in energy. So this negative energy means that we're going to a lower energy, right? We're losing energy. And so the energy that we're losing in our um, atom is what's being emitted as a photon. So the energy that the photon has is the positive version of 3.025 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Okay. So the Adam is losing that delta N, that negative 3.025. So the photon is what gains that energy, right? Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So the photon gains that energy that it's losing. And so the energy that the electron has is the 3.025 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. 
Okay, does that make sense in terms of question, or does that have any questions in terms of why that's a positive answer here? All right, I think I'll take silence as a yes. Yep. So, yep. So the answer is going to be the positive, right? So when we look at the when we look at an atom, right? We have the nucleus, we have n is equal to one, n is equal to two, n is equal to three, right? Let's pretend that that is all circular. Wow, that got worse. Okay, so this is n is equal to one, n is equal to two, n is equal to three. So as we go from a higher energy level of n is equal to three, our electron, oops, our electron is here. We're going to go down to n is equal to two. So as the atom itself loses energy, the photon is emitted with that energy. Okay. So the photon's energy cannot be negative. It's the positive. So it's the change. This change here is that delta E. And so since we go from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, it has to be negative, right? Because we're going from high to low. Um, and then we're doing final minus initial. So the energy that the atom is losing is what's turned into the energy of the photon. And so that energy of the photon is positive. It's kind of like how, um, right? If you're going forward in one direction, the other reverse is also happening in terms of a chemical equation. Um, so like one is going to be forward, one's going to be backwards. One's going to be losing energy while one is going to be gaining energy. Okay, does that make a little bit more sense? It cannot, I can try and explain it again. Okay, perfect. Okay, and so now that you know the energy of this photon, this is the... Right? I could ask you what the wavelength, what the frequency is of this, and then you can use your other equations of your energy is equal to hc over lambda to find your wavelength maybe, and then you can use your c is equal to lambda frequency to find your frequency. Okay. You could also use energy is equal to h frequency to find your frequency, right? Stuff like that. Okay, so once you have the energy, you can kind of go back to those other um, equations that we had as well. Alrighty, any other questions for me today? Does that help clear up a couple of things that were covered this week so far? Okay, awesome, great. Happy, happy to be helpful. <laughs> Alrighty, so if that's it for today, um, again, thank you so much for um, accommodating my schedule. I appreciate it so much. Um, when this is done recording and um, I get it back, I'll upload it to YouTube and then I'll upload it to Canvas so that you have um, this to look back well as well. Um, and then I'll post some practice problems for this weekend as well. Alrighty, um, if that's it, have a great night. Enjoy your Thursday. Happy almost Friday. And I'll see you in class tomorrow.